So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Simon for the next presentation. Thank you, Susanna. I've switched my phone off. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how you switch your phone off, then tweet, but I'll leave that up to you to sort out. Um, what I'm looking, going to go through for the next half hour, and I'm afraid that's all I've got, is to go through the recommended list for cereals and oil seeds. It's a, a fair old, um, a lot of information which is coming through in half an hour. Uh, but something which happened last year is that I did get um, asked um, by one of your organisations whether I could go and um, talk to you and provide you with more information, so I'm quite happy to do that. What I'm going to look at is the trials behind the list, why are we doing the recommended list, uh, and also um, start to look at the sort of features which we um, judge varieties by. It, it's not all about yield. Uh, the other thing comes down to looking at the quality for end use. Um, one area we're going to look at, as you're aware, there's some now some uh, quite some cracking um, bread making varieties with very high yields, but the proteins are lower as far as the, um, uh, the standards are concerned. So is that an issue? Uh, the thing which I think is quite important is you could see the recommended list as two things. One is a series of trials for us to select varieties, like a witch list, but actually it's a massive resource of data. And what um, I myself and my team are really keen to do is to drill down in all that data we have to try and understand a little bit more about why certain sites gave us record yields, as they did this year, or for that matter, why some did particularly badly this year. And by collecting data throughout the UK over a range of seasons, as long as we're measuring things, we might actually be able to understand a bit more. So that's why, you know, that second, sorry, I'm shining the laser at you, I don't mean to do that. <laughs> the, that's why the second one is really important because um, there's obviously a lot of changes. I mean, you could say, well, the markets keep changing as well. Things are not static. And what you need to be careful is we're not selecting varieties based on how well they actually perform this year, because next year could be very different. For You've got here a pyramid, which I think is quite a useful way of looking at how um, the varieties which are coming up for recommendation next month uh, started their life back in 2012 with the breeders selecting over, say, 800 lines. Uh, they then go through a statutory process of trials, the NL1, NL2, and we use that data. Um, but what we can then do is start to select candidates, candidate varieties, which we suspect might provide the industry with the varieties it requires. And then they go through another year of testing. And so this year, we'll they'll be sort of whittling down those 800 down to just a few varieties. Where do we put the trials? Here you can see we've got the wheat trials. We run about 500 trials. Uh, some are big trials and some are relatively small for specific um, quality characteristics. Um, and you can see that the majority of them are on the east because that's where the majority of the wheat is grown. But one thing I was really keen to do is to have trials in the extremes. You could say, why on earth are you putting group one wheats up in Aberdeenshire? Uh, because that's not where the market is but it doesn't have to put the variety under a test. And who's to say that the weather conditions we've got in Aberdeenshire, you know, you could have an extreme, which means that you've got those in East Anglia, say in the next two, three, four, five years. Something else which, again, we've brought in the last few years is to start to get the weather data from these sites. And this is the weather data actually from our Kaywood site, which gave us our astounding yields. We got over 17 tonnes per hectare. Uh, right away we go back, are you sure? And we, you know, we have to make sure that what we've got there is uh, our real effects. Obviously we use the bit, best bit of the field and small plots, um, but actually it's quite an interesting site because there we've got very high yielding um, results, and yet at other sites we've got um, the trials averaging eight tonnes per hectare, and it allows us now to compare the two. What we did look at was where our trials were, because um, one thing which is important is, as you're aware, we have a regional team, 
and um, the northwest, uh, Northern Ireland, and the west of England, there are growers there who are interested to see how varieties perform in their region. Now, the thing is with us is that the resources are very much in the areas where you've got um, most of the crop. But as I mentioned before, those extremities, there's an important local need, so we need sufficient data, um, A, so that a you know, you can go and actually see the recommended list trials in the ground at open days, but also to make sure that over our three or five year average, there's sufficient data for you, first of all, to look to see, well, how a variety performs in the UK, and then based on a limited data to see how well those varieties perform in your region. Right, I'm not going, to get going through all of this, but you always hear, well, the recommended list is all about yield, isn't it, and nothing else. That's not the case. That said, yield is important um, and because, in effect, if you've got a variety that's um, perfect in every way but is uh, very low in yield, chances are it won't be commercially successful. So the first thing is we will set a yield target and the chances are they'll be based upon the most popular, highest yielding varieties which we've currently got and they vary dependent on your end, end market. But obviously, what the um, quality of the grain um, does is very important, and that's why we use NABIM, and they will test the varieties uh, for bread making and biscuits. Uh, NABIM have this group four, which is really, although I've got it potentially as other, you know, feed, it's actually another category. Uh, but there are some useful varieties there for other niche markets. And the question is how we, how we give that data uh, for other end users to um, make their selections for other varieties. Uh, standing ability is very important, as is disease. Disease resistance is important. And I'll go through some of that as to how we um, deal with the um, ratings later. Right, so those, um, we have committees for different crops and they determine the relative importance of characteristics. So on the whole, high yield, um, specific weight's got to be good, Hagberg's got to be good for your um, bread making quality, the crop's got to stand, and also it's got to be relatively early. Now there is a risk here, we don't want breeders to breed for a system, we want them to breed good varieties. And that's why you know, we do need experts in order to determine the criteria in which we're going to select these varieties. And things change, as you can imagine, that uh, at particular points, then there may be certain characteristics which become more important. Now, the way the committees would work is that if a variety is higher yielding than our target, and it meets all the minimum standards, then the chances are that's going to have an easy ride to get recommended. If you're below the yield target, then there's got to be something special about that variety over and above the, what we call the comparative varieties in order for that variety to be selected. And the lower the yield, then in effect you need bigger and bigger um, sort of positive aspects for that variety in order to get on the list. But you can find, you can get low yielding varieties which are on there which may have particularly good disease resistance and they can get on the list. Whether they're commercially successful or not is another matter. Uh, and the other question is, um, how durable is that resistance? Now, the trouble is, uh, all we've got is historic data. And, and that's why once they've got recommended, it's not to say that the next year things will change. Uh, and in my area of expertise is particularly on the diseases. And again, this afternoon, there'll be a lot of information about monitoring because obviously things can ch change within a season. And actually trying to manage a resistant variety is sometimes more challenging than a variety which you know is already susceptible to disease. What data do we have? Well, uh, what we have here is a list. Uh, this is the average yield of the trials and the sow date. Now, straight away, uh, unfortunately, with the system, we have to get data from the previous season it, all in and then we have to make decisions on new candidates, which means that we struggle to get trials actually probably in the window a lot of you are recommending your um, clients to drill. And that is an unfortunate weakness of the system. But I guess the way we could fill that is just by having additional trials, uh, which we just say, well, let's put the recommended list varieties in there, and the new candidates will just have to wait a year. Um, there has been, uh, we do have some very early drill trials where we do have a subset. 
and there's more interest now in later sown uh, for our, in trials as well. And for those, we will then have a mixture of winter wheat and spring wheat. Uh, so in effect, now our, our window really is from August uh, drilling uh, for the winter wheat right up to the end of January for the winter wheat. But the amount of data we have at the extremities is probably more limited than it is in that major part there. We need to make sure we're covering all the soil types. And this is where you need to watch that you're not necessarily, you know, if you're starting to tease out the data, you might decide, well, actually, varieties, say, in light soils are performing in a particular way. But just watch it, because it may well be that the majority of our light soil trials are in the north. And therefore, there could be, you know, the reasons behind the certain characteristics could be because they're from the north, northern region and not necessarily from the light sandy soils. But we do have to make sure our trials do represent the, uh, those particular areas. I think you can, imagine, you can see with our contractors, they do prefer um, drilling, you know, in, in a relatively early in good, good seedbed conditions and good soils. Um, because the thing is that if they, if we start to, um, you know, want some trials grown, say in early January, there's a higher risk of failure, um, and you can see that from their point of view, if a trial fails, then they might think, well, we're not going to pay them for it. But we have to be aware of that that we do want data from all these different um, sort of scenarios regarding drill date and also soil types. Um, end markets, um, that's obviously very important, and we have to have the buy-in from the end, end users. Otherwise, as you're aware, uh, they're pretty conservative. They'll just stick with what they know. Uh, so as far as the samples are concerned, uh, then NABIM in, are involved very much with their NABIM groups. We would supply them with samples of grain. One thing to be aware of is that um, not all of our trials are run to a milling spec, uh, so it's not necessarily realistic, you know, for example, to take grain samples where we've been using lower nitrogen, in particular, say, in the west of England. But we have quality strips as well, where, in effect, they're grown purely to get the, the quality grain they require. Because otherwise you could say, well, you know, a variety has failed. It's not a group one, but actually it never made this spec in the first place. I thought I'd highlight that 13% protein because uh, probably as you're aware, we've now got some very high yield in group ones and group twos, which, um, you know, given the uh, current agronomics, <coughs> aren't necessarily making uh, those particular um, targets of 13% protein. Uh, other than NABIM, uh, there's also interest in exports. And uh, the, for the exports, then, there is a particular series of tests which are done, be it for bread making or, for that matter, for soft wheats. And uh, it's not necessarily the case that a Group 1 wheat will be acceptable uh, for all export markets. For example, the uh, quality of the flour they require in France is different from what we require in the UK. So these are useful tests, and it opens up the markets, uh, particularly if you're close to a, um, a, a port where you can export your grain. I just wanted to bring up the protein aspect. Now, this is something we were quite interested in, um, because currently with the baking tests, they're very subjective. And what one end user may say, that, that bread makes a good flour for a good loaf, <laughs> may in effect be very different from another. And something we were trying to look at is to whether there's a, actually a test we could do which provided everyone with more information. So in effect, it's not necessarily the total protein that's important. It's the amount of what we call the functional protein which is important. And in effect, the concern here is, is that you may find higher yields mean lower protein. But that's not a problem just as long as you have the right sort of protein in your, in your amount. Whether the trade will change, if they're, if they're going to pay you on a premium, for example, then OK, go for Crusoe, because that will give you the protein. But I'm hoping that you know, the end users, we can work with the end users to understand more that, OK, their you know, Skyfall might give them a lower protein. This year, actually, they've been pretty good, so it's not an issue. So we need to work with the end users to be aware that, actually, it's the functional protein that's important. And how should we measure this? 
For a start, the two aspects are it's really the ratio of the glutenin and the gliadin, which is very important. And these vary dependent upon the, uh, the way in which the end user makes its, its flour or its pastries. Uh, for example, you can see that uh, the bread you you know, the flour you require for a, a loaf of bread would be very different from pizza. And one thing which we did do is um, we were working with Camden, who first of all, you know, you can just measure the total protein, but what they were looking at was in effect using HPLC methods to identify the different ratios of pro to protein, and they do vary dependent upon the variety as you'd expect but they also varied from wherever the sample came from. And the other thing they can then do is with very small quantities of grain is then produce um, a dough which they can measure. And I think that's, that's an area where I think for the, with the recommended list, we're very keen to go forward to get a bit more detailed information about the, the quality of the dough. Um, just to show you here that obviously there is an influence regarding the variety uh, and also, the, um, you can see there are environmental aspects too. How much nitrogen has the um, crop picked up to en enable it to convert that to protein? So the two go together. And here's an example of one of the tests which um, Camden were using. And the good thing here is, is you may have, you know, if you remember those 800 lines, with these sort of tests, you can very rapidly um, identify the levels of protein or the quality of protein and then with a small quantity of grain you can then get um, a lot more information. So I'm hoping that these sort of techniques will be used in the future. As far as the number of varieties on the recommended list is concerned, there's a comment to say that the numbers are increasing. Is that a problem? You're the agronomists and this is where you can say, okay, if you've got five, six, seven new varieties, they're all better yielding, they're all giving you better quality, why shouldn't they be on the recommended list? Um, okay, it may make your, um, the grower's job more difficult um, or the end user's job more difficult, but actually it makes it more interesting for you. Probably the thing which we would like to do is to remove the older varieties more quickly. If you look on the recommended list, we have a variety called Claire. Claire came on the list in 1999. It's languishing at the bottom of the yield for the group threes, um, but actually the end users still want Claire. Um, so what do we do? And actually we, we even tried, we tried to get it off this year, but they were clinging on to put it, keep it on for another year. We're not necessarily going to learn much more about Claire, but it is always a challenge. And it's quite funny, as agronomists, we have them on the, on the committee. They may start the meeting to say, this list is getting too long, we need to get some off. And then we say, what about Claire? Oh no, you can't get rid of that. You know. But that's the sort of challenges we have. But what we would like to do is focus on getting new data on new varieties, because they're the varieties which we're all struggling to get good data for. These are the varieties which went on the recommended list last year. And it shows you we got 28 on and 27 off. And um, you can see that, um, OK, yield is not everything, as you're aware, for certain quality markets. But the yields were going in the right direction compared to the, um, the common controls we're using. Something else we can look at here is um, the ratio of um, end, you know, end uses here. The, uh, you can see here, this for 2015-16 shows you the um, so percentage of the area which would to group one and two varieties, group threes and fours. We seem to be getting cluttered up as far as we've got lots and lots of varieties in the group three. They're the soft wheats, uh, biscuit wheats, uh, there might be some there for distilling. And we seem to have got a massive choice of variety for a very limited market. And that's something I think you know, we need to look at. Um, the soft group fours is an interesting area. I mean, I'm based more in Scotland, where that's where you get your distilling varieties from. But you know, feed is not necessary to feed. And one area we did discuss before was about the quality of the quality of the weeds. But, um, for example, what is it that the poultry um, industry require for their feed? Is it different from the pig? 
or the dairy. Um, now, we can spend an awful lot of time and money on research on that, but one thing we've got to be aware of is at the end of the day, they'll probably just buy on price. And that's something, well, if they're not really all that bothered, um, well, okay, let's just go for a high-yielding hard feed and then go from there. But I think you know, we always need to um, understand more about whether these end-use end industries are keen to understand a bit more about the wheat. Um, but for growers, it's a matter of will they pay for it. Now, something which um, is coming up too, I've just taken two examples of varieties which were recommended last year. Here you've got Reflection, it's a new feed variety, high yielding, high yielding feed, and we've got KWS Lily, it's a group two variety, again very high yielding. And I've put it against JB Diego. JB Diego is still a very popular variety. Can anybody give me a reason why is JB Diego so popular? Consistent, okay. Yes, you've got lots of data, you know how it's going to perform, and growers have learned how to grow it. So I think you can see, you know, if I was a grower, well, that's one which did well for me. I know how it performs. I'll stick with it. Unfortunately, not all varieties will remain the same, but you can see that you can see why these older varieties remain. And you'd be crazy to say, well, I'll go from um, having 60% of my acreage into Diego and I'll move out into Lily and then suddenly find, hmm, actually Lily doesn't do too well in those second wheat crops I've got. Or it might be later and it may, might not quite fit. So despite all the work we do in small plot trials, then it's a matter of, you know, you've got to work with your um, uh, growers to find out what fits their particular um, system. Um, and I went to one of the monitor farms in Wales and they were still growing Clare. And after being so rude about Clare, we went through it and actually Clare fitted his particular climate and his particular end market really well. And when we looked at the whole list, actually we couldn't find a variety which actually um, he could replace it with. So there's a lot to be said for that. But it's quite an interesting area that if you've got a variety such as Lily, which is a, gives you potential quality, but also a good yield, that's a variety which is worth looking at. But if you're going for quality, treat it as a quality crop. Because the last thing to do is to say, well, I'll put it in the ground and we'll have a look in what, and see what it does. Well, you can probably get bet in that situation, the chances are you may not necessarily meet the spec you require. So you've got to treat it well. But at least you know that if you don't meet that spec, it should yield relatively well. Some other aspects with reflection. Um, reflection is an interesting variety, but it hasn't been proven on consistency. And if you look at the recommended list yields, have a look at the um, annual yields. Because we've had some very different years, and reflection on average has done really well, but in some years it's not done so well as in others. And therefore, it's there, and it's a really good variety, and now we can start to learn more about, well, okay, how consistent is that variety? Just a quick thing on disease um, ratings. Um, it's not just a matter of Jenna, who does the ratings, who you speak to later, picking numbers out of a hat. It'd be easy if it was. Um, but in effect, there's a lot of data that goes in behind this. Here's sort of the disease progress of a susceptible variety. Where do you take the um, assessments from? Not too early, because what can happen there is the low number it may be a low disease pressure year, and we don't want that to be converted into resistance because it's not. Likewise, if you assess too late, it becomes extremely difficult to get an accurate assessment. Is that a dead leaf or is that the disease? Um, so, but we do accept several assessments over the season during the progress, and uh, we would take potentially all of those and average them out. And then you've got a lot of data coming from a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of trials. Um, it's a logarithmic scale, which means that the, you know, the difference between a, a nine and an eight would be quite, um, so, so you could say, subtle compared to the difference between a three and a four. 
And in effect, you can see here, this is Septura tritici. I don't think currently there are any varieties above seven. There's pl still plenty of scope for people to bring eights. I'm not sure whether we'll ever find nines. So it'd be good if we do. But I think you can see here that um, you know, the, the numbers, um, the difference between a, a four, the five, and a six in particular, you, know, you can see that it's a logarithmic type scale. And it's actually shown very much um, more on this particular slide here, which is for yellow rust. Um, you can see here that where a variety has got a rating of two or three, then um, you can see that there's been a, a sort of a massive increase in the development of yellow rust compared to those with the lower ratings. Now, I mentioned before that managing a resistant variety is quite challenging. Um, because if you've got a, uh, even a variety with a rating of three, you know what's going to happen. You've got to protect it early, and then you're in control of it. But what do you do with your variety with a rating of nine or eight? There's no disease. You're in, say, the Whiz Beach area. It's a high-pressure area. Do you ignore the yellow rust? And this is where I think, again, you'll probably discuss this more in the afternoon regarding monitoring and also risk. But as far as, you know, as you're aware, actually these more resistant varieties where you're trying to make best use of the variety and its resistance, you've got a grower who is potentially saying you're spending too much money, so you've got a lot of pressure on you. Um, but at the same time, you've got pathogens out there which may actually have changed. So it's always an interesting job. Okay, so here's the, your sort of ideal variety, or here's my ideal variety. And one of the points that came out there was consistency. What we're looking at with a data set over several years is, are there are different statistical approaches we can take looking at the data. It's not so easy when you look at all those numbers to identify whether one is better than another. Um, but what they can do is uh, there's two of these methods. I'm not necessarily see, saying these are the best. It may well be as a combination of methods we want to use in order to identify, you know, to put a number against one variety to be consistent and another one not. But one way is to see how well a variety performs in different extremes compared to the pack of varieties. Is it always okay? And the other is really um, how the variety performs um, really across a range of trials. Don't worry, there's not a test on this, but here's a very good example, just purely to take the yields from three different regions. And if you take KWS Gator, it's got a pretty good yield, and actually the yields you've got in all three regions are pretty tight. And in the statistical method, that's come out as being, okay, quite consistent. Okay, I'm gonna get, as a variety, seed area is probably about 1% or less. It's never became commercially successful. It's a bit of a shame, because actually you're getting a good yield from that feed variety, and it's consistent. <laughs> so there must be other reasons why some varieties become popular other than being consistent. Now at the other extreme, we've got Crusoe, and in the north, um, you can see from the north trials, um, it, it is a variety that's very variable. You could say, well, so what? Because in effect, that's not where its market is. I mean, group one wheats, um, really, you know, you're know, you not going to grow those up in the north. But it is useful for us to try and understand, well, why does that particular variety not perform particularly well in the north? Um, and then I think that's, you can see how we're trying to understand, are there, for example, any situations we might find in the east which may mean that the variety will perform as it has done in Aberdeenshire. If you want more on that, then you'll have to come to the agronomist conference. Right, this is something which Jenna has done regarding the risk, and this is looking at relative risk of new varieties. With all those ratings, which you can look at uh, you know, separately, we, pr we can produce an agronomic merit rating, and uh, that's based on disease resistance, which is weighted dependent upon the, um, their importance. Do you remember that early table I showed you? Lodging's important, uh, and therefore the higher the rate merit rating, the better the variety. And then you have the untreated yield. And you can see that if you base it on the averages, and by the way, um, 
Diego would be about in the middle of that, is about an average variety. You can then see that uh, varieties which have a good agronomic merit rating and a, and a high untreated yield are potentially relatively lower risk than a variety that may in effect have a lower rating. Santiago, you can see, is a higher risk. You know that. Chances are you know how to grow it. And as long as you know how to grow it, you'll get a nice consistent yield out of it. Um, but you can see that if you were thinking of taking a punt on trying some revelation, it's worth a go. And actually, relatively, as long as things st remain stable, um, you know, when you're trying that variety out, it, it shouldn't suddenly fail on you. So I think this is something which we want to move towards. Uh, so you're not just necessarily recommending purely on out-and-out -out yield, but we're understanding a bit more about how that variety might perform um, in different environmental circumstances. Uh, another colleague, Ellie, she has taken all the information and she's made uh, web-based <coughs> tools, which allows you to um, drill down a bit more into the information. One area we said is, first of all, look at the national picture as to how a variety performs. That's where we've got all the data. But obviously, then, below that is to say, if you're in the west of the UK, start to drill down and look at to see how it performs in the west of the UK. And then, if you want to know locally what, how it's working, we've broken the um, country down into the Met Office um, weather areas. And that's based on very limited data, but I think you can then start to drill down and see, well, okay, that variety seems to perform okay in the UK and the West, and it seems okay in that region. And you can use this then to discuss with your growers whether that variety is worth, um, worth trying against your tried and tested variety. So you'd be pleased to know, I know I'm at my time, um, really just a summary. What's the RL about? Um, hopefully the important word there is independent. What we're trying to provide is independent information on how a variety performs, um, both on the UK and different regions. We're testing uh, for particular end uses, and that's really important because if the end use doesn't have confidence in the variety, it'll never become popular. Um, we can, uh, to a certain extent, something we have done, which I've not mentioned in the talk, is look at things such as specific weight and protein levels in the recommended list trials and compare them with national surveys. I mean, it's quite useful to find out whether our recommended list trials perform in a similar way to commercial crops. And I think that's an important thing which we do do. Um, where do we want to go? Um, one thing I'm keen to look at is whether we need to drill down a bit more about the quality of these varieties, particularly for end use. Um, and also, um, it may well be in the future, is to look at how these varieties perform into different nitrogen regimes. Uh, and really, you make best use of the untreated yields, which a grower may say is, un is irrelevant to them, but they do help us identify the relative risk of a variety. Thanks, Sam. Okay, we've, we've probably got about four or five minutes for some questions. Anybody want to kick off? Yeah. With the trials that you use to generate the data for recommended, do you do them all on the same, same rates, or do you do variables? <laughs> right. Yes, the protocols, quite, uh, the, there are prescriptive fungicide programs we have. They're quite strict. Uh, the, the fungicide program is very much to try and keep levels of disease all down to 5% or the best we can do. And likewise, with the plant growth regulator, we do have a, um, a prescriptive PGR program, but there is flexibility in the PGR program for them to, to do what they want. But there are a lot of other things which we want them grown to local agronomic practice. Now, uh, with seed rates, we will have a range. Uh, this is particularly important, say, with oilseed rape. Uh, oilseed rape is quite challenging, actually. Um, we would go for a, a target plant population of about 40 plants per square meter. And it could well be that some of your progressive farmers have gone way, way below that. Uh, but in a trialing situation, that gives us a real challenge. If we said, well, we want to go down to 20, 
uh, per square meter. Um, if we lose a few from slugs, then the, the plots look very patchy and uh, we'll then not necessarily get the information we require. But likewise with nitrogen, they've got to follow RB209 guidelines for their area. Um, we will, for lodging trials, we will ask them to put more on, more nitrogen on, because we want those purely to test the straw strength and not the yield. Um, so we do, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line here because you can't say you must spray this on a particular date because the protocols for trials which are down in Cornwall, Aberdeenshire or Kent. Um, but you know, we, we do allow a little bit of flexibility you know, to, so that they are done to local practice. Any other questions? I've got a question for you, Simon. Um, you mentioned the relative risk of different varieties. Do you think it's possible to, to, to design packages of agronomy that would work with different types of variety? It's interesting. I think, first of all, um, so in other words, I, I personally think no. I think you still need, uh, because you have your grower and their perception of risk, and actually your own perception of risk too, what you're happy to go with, I think that's going to be very challenging. I think it's easy, you know, you know, if you've got a group of growers in a region, you talk about things, you try things out. I think the problem is, is that something which might work one year could be very different the next. I think actually it's the, it's the flexibility so that you're not running, you're not trying to grow them to a recipe. Um, you, you, but hopefully what we can do is provide you with much information about how that variety, variety might perform. But uh, I think beyond that, it does require the local skills of the grower and the agronomist in order to grow it. Okay. And there's, there's all sorts of different um, aspects of, of uh, how you manage varieties. And actually, in some ways, Simon has raised <coughs> more questions than, than, than answers. But hopefully today there'll be plenty of opportunity to speak to Simon. Um, and actually we have one now because we have our first uh, break um, for coffee. So if you would like to make your way back out uh, to, the, to, to, to the foyer out there. Um, and all of the team will be there um, for some uh, further discussion. 